All right, well, good evening. Um, thank you for coming. I'm glad that you could join us. Um, I would like to thank George Washington High School for hosting us here um, this evening. Um, also, just um, restroom information. So if you go out into the hall, women's is to the left, kind of around the corner. Men's is to the right, um, around the corner. So feel free you need to use the restroom uh, to take off at any time. Um, so tonight we kick off um, People's Planning Academy 2.0. How many of you were participants in our first academy? All right, well, I'm glad to have you back. Um, and we're excited um, that we have some special guests here tonight. We have some people watching um, on public TV. Um, and we have some new participants in the second one in Canada. And so the PPA was really formed um, to help demystify the planning process. We in city government do a lot of different types of plans, a lot of different processes. We speak our own jargon, and it's very confusing. And so we recognize that, and so we really want to invest in our neighbors, um, really, so we can empower you all to be better advocates, stronger advocates for your own neighborhoods. And so we're excited uh, for you to be here. Now, 23 days ago, um, rapid transit returned to our city for the first time in generations. Um, so, yes, so congrats. That, that's very exciting. And so, um, this program is actually part of a process um, to respond to that. So what happens to our neighborhoods, um, our districts around transit stations now that we have rapid transit um, coming back? And so the city of Indianapolis, um, in partnership with Indigo and the Indianapolis Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, are working on a process to update city policies and procedures, including updates to our zoning code, to uh, make sure that this half billion dollar impact for this half billion dollar investment that our residents are making in our transit system actually maximizes um, the benefits to our community. And so we are in the process of doing a zoning process. Um, and so today, to get you thinking um, about different ways to think about our city, um, we're honored to have a national recognized leader um, that will hopefully um, challenge you to rethink how we understand and think and build our city. Um, but before we get to him, um, I'd like to introduce Graham Smith. Um, Graham is with um, the associate principal with the planning firm Gould Evans, who is the firm that's leading our process to update our zoning code um, here in the city. So he'll give you a brief kind of intro to what transit-oriented development um, is all about, and then we'll turn it over to our keynote speaker. So, Graham. Thank you, Brad. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, as Brad said, we are. Uh, working with the city um, on planning for transit-oriented development around uh, the new transit lines. Um, and as he also said, is I want to give you a brief introduction and kind of the way we're going about approaching TOD and what's important about TOD for the future of the community. Is this on? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and so I'm going to give that brief introduction and then Joe's going to come out and um, um, dazzle you all with some thoughts about how you should think about your city in the future. Um, and so, to be fairly brief with what we're doing, um, my name is Graham Smith, I'm with Gould Evans, we're a 45-year-old design firm, and for about the last 30 years, we've been working with communities to do long-range planning, uh, to do urban design, and write zoning codes, which is the project that we're undertaking with the city of Indianapolis. Um, with me tonight also is Joe Minicosi, who uh, you'll hear from in a little bit, but his firm, Urban3, um, specializes in uh, the data-driven results of looking at communities um, and planning for the future based on the data, and uh, as I said, he's going to dazzle you here in a few minutes with uh, some of his stories. For about the last 70 years, um, the United States, most communities in the United States have planned for this. Um, which is on your screen today, and really it's about planning for the automobile. Um, regionally and locally, we've created places like this. And so, as the tides have started to change a little bit and starting to look at our communities in a different way, we start to realize that a lot of these places were built out of convenience and economic development, or at least that's what they sold us on. Um, and as you can realize and as you participate in your daily lives and use these areas, you recognize that neither one of those things are truly real with these types of developments. So as we continue to have these conversations about changing the way we develop our communities and really truly city building, um, some new ideas have emerged. Um, what I would 
uh, say to you is that a lot of these ideas are not new. Um, they are the way that we used to do things. We just reprioritize some of the things that we wanted to do in our communities over time. One of those things, as we've already said, is transit-oriented development, or literally development patterns, development scale form that supports the operations of transit systems, um, like your new red line and your future purple, blue, and green line. Um, transit-oriented development is typically a complete community that offers goods and services, that offers housing opportunities, uh, that off offers opportunities to business, and it offers them all in a setting that is relatable to transit, but also starts to create community um, with the interaction and compactness that's found within these developments. Uh, you all have some good examples in your community already um, that were originally built around the streetcar lines um, ages ago, it seems like. Um, but what's nice about these areas or what's unique about these areas in most communities is that they withstand the test of time because the basic framework of how they were built is still there. So even as places, even as places like Broad Ripple have changed over time, have seen new development, the basic framework upon which it was built still holds true today. And we'll go through some of those things here in a minute. Pl neighborhoods like Irvington hold those same kind of patterns and, and pieces that are important to transit-oriented development. As I said today, um, and up until today, up until the current time over the past 70 years, we've really reprioritized the things that we wanted to do with our communities and really gotten away from the whole idea of community. When you stop and think back, the origins of cities have always been about bringing people together, whether it was for trade, uh, for entertainment, for just being a community. It was always designed, cities were always designed to bring people together. Um, and so we understand, or we know, that communities best work their best when they create those interactions between people. And when we talk about people, we mean people. We don't mean cars. And so that's what transit-oriented development has a lot to do, is creating places for people and allow those connections to occur throughout the community to give access to people. Today, however, a lot of our communities are built around these ideas, whether it's the car, whether it's the drive through whether it's... Um, large lots that um, provide ample parking. Um, but as I said, the, the conversation is shifting. Even in Indianapolis, the, the conversation is shifting. You're starting to see things more in support of transit, more compact development, um, and more diverse development within individual neighborhoods. So what is transit-oriented development? For us, uh, and for the way you develop transit-oriented development, there's three critical components. There's the compactness, there's the connectedness, and there's the diversity. So when we talk about compact, we talk about most people feel comfortable in about a 10-minute walk. Um, so what can we put within a 10-mile walking distance that's relatable to transit that can give full service to a person during their daily activities? So when we start to build in the, the grid network, we start to stuff that with different types of uses and things that support daily life in a, in a short walking distance. It's also well connected. The more connected a place is, the more direct, easy, shorter routes you have to destinations, whether it's goods and services, whether it's getting home, whether it's accessing the transit stop, whatever the case may be, a better connected community locally feeds into a better connected system regionally. And then finally, diversity. So when we talk about diversity, we're talking about providing multiple reasons for people to be in a place. Whether it's small business, whether it's housing, whether it's services, entertainment, recreation, whatever the case may be, what people are looking for in the community, if we can locate those in a neighborhood or in an area that's supported by transit, there's more opportunities for more people to use those areas. So why is transit-oriented development important? Again, there's three kind of primary things that we look for in terms of creating quality places uh, and transit-oriented development places, and there's three primary benefits. One is greater access. When you focus on transit-oriented development locally in particular, you start to create what we would consider a multimodal uh, transit experience, which includes uh, automobiles, bikes, pets, and transit. Um, to allow you to access different opportunities within not only the local market, but within the region. So it provides greater access. Second, it creates place. 
through design of transit-oriented development uh, areas, it starts to create a community identity and ultimately community ownership by that neighborhood or by that small community uh, in that place that they're trying, that they live, work, or play. And then finally, and what Joe's going to talk in depth about is this idea of transit-oriented development creating value within your community. Um, so really taking advantage of leveraging some of the public investments, the infrastructure, the transit system that's been put in place with the value of the properties around them by their development. Um, and as I said, Joel will get into more detail in that aspect. So how do we go about doing this? How do we start to define what transit-oriented development is? Or how do we start to create that? So focusing on four critical components um, we believe will get you to trans-oriented de development. The first one is public space. If you think about public space in terms of your park system, your street networks, uh, your civic spaces, the public space really is one of the most important components of any community. It's the way every single individual who experiences Indianapolis experiences the city, is through the public spaces. Whether it's walking down the street, playing in a park, driving down the street, riding transit, whatever the case may be, that's how you experience your communities. So the design of that public space has to be well thought out to encourage the types of connectivity you want, whether it's walking, biking, uh, transit, automobile, or a balance of all of those things. The public space also frames the development context. So the, it helps to define the development patterns, the scale, the orientation of that development to those public spaces. And finally, it expresses, the public space really expresses your community. Um, it expresses your values, it expresses your vision for the future, and so it really creates that community identity, even on a local level, and so, as uh, like a transit stop. The second piece is urban form. So when we talk about form, we talk about the scale or size of development, and the relationship of that development to those public spaces. The form of development starts to create those outdoor rooms in relationship to the public space that people will use and people will return to and that really people start to identify their community, whether it's their localized neighborhood or their broader community in terms of these spaces. Third is the mix of uses. So again, trying to provide a mix of uses to encourage people to use those areas or to frequent those destinations within a specific space. And so mixing those uses, um, whether again, it's commercial, uh, housing, recreational services, it gives people opportunities and reasons to be in a location. And then finally, housing diversity. Housing diversity over the long haul can create a stable housing market in any neighborhood or community. Um, it also provides um, access to different communities for different folks. It also provides proximity to the transit lines for access to uh, the investments that are being made. And so housing diversity is a critical component as well. So when you pay attention to those four design elements, what we would consider design elements, you really start to create places that people gravitate towards. Whether it's Broad Ripple that we've talked about earlier, it's Irvington, um, or it's places like Fountain Square that have become more of a destination um, for people uh, in the city or other places across, really across the United States or across the world, it's paying attention to those small details that allow people to uh, actually fall in love with those places and either call them home or their third place in their life that they like to hang out uh, and spend time. And then finally, uh, and I'll turn it over to Joe here, but really the value proposition is something that drives this as well. Um, and Joe's gonna go into a lot of detail about the value proposition and a different way to think about your community, but when you pay attention to the small details, you start to create lasting value in places, even as they evolve over time, whether that's growing or just changing, you start to create long-term value. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe, and we're gonna try another technology trick here, and we'll see if it works well.
the tech here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Sweet. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, hi, my name is Joe Manicosi. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. I'm going to test the limits of the technology by wandering around a little bit. Um, when I talk about cities, the first thing that I try to do is give you some metaphor for how do you think about your city in the future. Um, and the easiest thing for me to think about this, and I'm just going to go ahead and boil my show down to like the first couple of slides, is that cities all have a DNA. So Indianapolis has a DNA, whether you like it or not, it's already baked into you. And are you paying attention to that DNA and do you have a model going forward? So if you want to see my DNA, this is when I was three months old and this is my trajectory, right? So I'm going to be, let's come on now. See if it'll work. It's not going to work. There we go. So I'm going to be my grandfather, whether I like it or not. Or more importantly, I'm going to be this guy, uh, my father. So I'm genetically Italian. You'll see that by how much I wave my hands around. Um, you can see that in my name. But in my family, we have a gene genetic predisposition to heart disease in addition to our genetic predisposition to being Italian. So I have this conflict in my life of the food that I eat and what's going on inside my body. So I have to plan for that, right? I have to, I like eating pizza, but I also can't do that every single day. So you all know this. You have family members that you look at. There's good habits and bad habits in my fa that father. And there's things that I need to do to grow smartly into the future. So the same question you should ask of Indianapolis. As you grow, what are some heart attacks that you can avoid that, let's say, Chicago has had or Atlanta? Are there things that are good growth models that you can steal from those places as well? It's not just the bad, but also the good. So pay attention to that. And I'm just going to go ahead and move over here. So one of the things that I've seen is that with cities is that we have a growth pattern that's essentially driving us broke, that's, that's destroying the wealth that we have in our communities. So we tend to lampoon and joke about suburbia, but it's real places called San Antonio. These are things that are growing in every community, and we're not asking the deeper questions on why that's happening. We, we cite it that it's the market, but there's taxation that's going behind this that's actually making that happen. Um, did you all know that the Nixon administration published the cost of sprawl in the year 1973? But there it is, cost of sprawl. This was something that they gave us as information to say, hey, this doesn't work. This pattern of development, it's 20 years old now at this point, it's not working. Yet we totally ignore that information. So we've known for close to 50 years that this pattern doesn't work, yet we keep on doing it. Well, why is that? Um, in 2009, I started a presentation with this quote right here. A person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read. This is a quote about literacy, right? If you choose not to read a book, you're just as illiterate as somebody that can't read a book. So let me ask you all a question in this room, show of hands, who's read your local taxation policy about how your land use taxes and your uh, real estate assessments work? Anyone? We got one half hand, two half hands. Okay, I'll give you one full hand for that. You know, we're not reading this stuff, yet it's driving the way that our cities work financially. It's driving the way that our cities are built from a physical standpoint as well. So if you're not choosing to read your tax system, you're illiterate about it. And we need to bring that into the planning aspect. So that's kind of what our firm does, is brings that forward. But let me tell you a quick little story about Asheville real quick. So I don't know if y'all have been to Asheville. Um, Asheville's about four hours uh, northeast of Atlanta, Blue Ridge Mountains, um, beautiful area, bluegrass music. We're 90,000 people. We have 40 breweries, 40, 40. We have a lot of beer in our city. That's about 2,500 people per brewery, if you want to do the math on that. Um, and like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little place. Well, Asheville didn't start this way. We get 10 million tourists a year that come through my, my county, which is wild for a town that's, that size, which is great. A lot of people come to Asheville. You drop your money in my community. That's awesome. Thanks for shopping in Asheville. But this is how Asheville started in the 1800s. And 20 years after this picture was taken, this is the same location. Asheville exploded. A lot of people don't realize Asheville was the second largest city in North Carolina. The only city that was bigger than Asheville was Winston-Salem. So Asheville's experienced this huge rise and this massive fall in its lifetime. So um, it, we suffered the same economic decline that a lot of American cities did. So by the 1980s, this is what we looked like. 
completely bombed out, uh, boarded up buildings. We were, we were just essentially too poor to tear them down. This is a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there. This isn't too long ago. So we had these art pieces of architecture we just walked away from. In like a Greek choir, any time somebody tried to do something downtown, we'd hear from the citizens. Well, we're not going to subsidize that downtown. We're done with that. We don't, we're not urban people. We're rural mountain people. That's who we are. Do y'all have people like that in your community? Every community I go to has the naysayers. The, this won't work, or we won't look at the whole span of human civilization and see that we've had urban environments for tens of thousands of years. Somehow we don't do that anymore. There's data. So uh, I worked for this guy's company. Julian Price uh, was a philanthropist who put $15 million into a for-profit real estate development company. Our job was to fix buildings and to also start businesses. So we'd start the businesses in black. So the first vegetarian restaurant we helped uh, capitalize in 1993 and basically put money behind entrepreneurs to make the things happen in our community that we needed. Um, so simple stuff like this. This is one of our buildings before and after. Um, these are four to 500 square foot apartments. Um, we wanted to have some smaller apartments for folks in the community, cheaper to rent. So show of hands, who would live in a four to 500 square foot apartment? Got about 10% of the room. Let me change the question. Who in this room has lived in a four to 500 square foot apartment? That's our marketing survey. So rather than think about where we were as a position, we thought about what a city is. And surely there's 28 people that are new to town, recently divorced, recently graduated from college, or whatever. They just want to downsize. And we, we fail to recognize that in our cities. We fail to recognize the opportunity for everyone. And we miss that. So that's what we were able to do. Um, but when we found ourselves constantly talking with our community about the data, why does it matter the work that we do downtown for y'all? What, what does it matter? So this is what's going on in our downtown. We're a $15 million investor in a downtown that's worth about $100 million. So our downtown as a collection of real estate was worth $100 million. Y'all follow me? Um, this is, we didn't get a do, new building in downtown Asheville until 2008. So basically, this is the value of historic preservation. Just by fixing up those upper stories, we grew our wealth to $500 million of community value, right? Now, to show you that it's not all love and roses in Asheville, this guy, Chris Peterson, there's Chris, he's actually a friend of mine, but Chris um, complained about the $26 million of investment into downtown for streetscape projects, parking garages, beautification projects. I mean, look at this poor guy's crying, he's so upset. And this is like council being shackled to these decisions. I like this, downtown development for bureaucrats instead of water, sewer, streets for our citizens. This guy's crying too. In Chris's mind, these were subsidies given to downtown real estate, which is kind of true. But $26 million is a lot of money. I don't have $26 million in my pocket. Do y'all have $26 million? No, that's a lot of money. But let's do some math for a second. If you invest $26 million on a $100 million asset and it grows to $500 million, is investing 26 and yielding $430 million, is that a good return on investment? Yeah. Why do we listen to Chris? You know, Chris isn't going to stop. He's got his own website now with fire and brimstone. I like this. Um, this is, he misspelled charlatans. This is the mayor right here. I asked the mayor, I said, is that a liquor drink? She said, it should be. You know, <laughs> he's got his opinion. That's great. We all should have our opinions met in the public realm, but there's facts and data that drive what we're all in this for. And we need to look at that. So, you know, this reminds me of this we've lost this ability to have a civic conversation and to, and to talk about this at, at a civic level. This is a kid's book that I found in a garage sale. So we've got the city, the town, and the country. City, town, and country, teacher's guide. Right, y'all follow me? This is a third grade textbook from 1959. So in kindergarten, you learn about your house, first grade the school, second grade the neighborhood, third grade you learn about regional planning. Did y'all do that? Remember this book? Third grade. In the book, it says things like this. While patterns vary from state to state, counties are responsible for education, library, health, welfare, et cetera. In studying the functions performed by your county, you will no doubt find there's a duplication of services and overlapping of jurisdictions and a lack of coordination between the county and the local communities within it. Y'all have that problem? I mean, you're a combined joint city-county government, and there's still these inefficiencies baked in. And this is something 1959. Um, you know, it's one of these Dick and Jane kind of books. It's painfully white. It's also misogynistic. The girls are shoved out in the hallway for some reason. 
But you read about a new factory that comes to town. There's even more children in each room, right? So you ask your children in blue right here. You probably can't read that from out there. It says, give four good reasons for building a new school. And so your, your third graders talk about what? Equity. Everybody should have a desk, right? Maybe get another teacher. That's called infrastructure. That's community needs, right? This is what we need. On the right, you read about Mr. Canfield, who lived next door to the Allens. He didn't want a new school. He says, our taxes are too high now. If we build a new school, we'll need more teachers than everything else, and we'll have to pay still higher taxes. That is indeed true. So you ask your third graders in blue, why would some people have to pay higher taxes, and why are some people against paying higher taxes? So your children can learn about community need and community cost, all on two pages. I know adults that can't have this conversation right now. You know, we talk about what we want or where our attitude is or what our place in life is without seeing the totality of what our community need is. And we're not raising it to a level of we're all in this together. This is basic civics. And we're seeing this writ large at our federal level and what's going on with the camps that we keep on fighting over without seeing that we're all in it together. And at some level, we have to raise our, our discussion of this. The, book, the part that remind, that's uh, probably most striking in the book is this statement right here. Remember, too, that many children, whether urban and rural and regardless of region, are tragically limited in their knowledge of their world, and their world is larger than the space in which they live and operate. We are all tragically limited in our understanding of our own communities. And if you talk to anybody about how they operate in their city, they're going to tell you about where they live, where they work, how they get their kids to school. And if there's a disturbance in that pattern, all of a sudden it's the mayor's fault, and I need a parking space downtown without seeing that there's a bigger picture here. This all has to work together. Do y'all follow me? Third graders having this conversation. And what I find is that this is straight out of Oxford American Dictionary to incorporate, to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So by law, the American city is a corporation. It's a social corporation. We're all in it together. And we have to think of it that way, that we're all shareholders in that corporation. And we have to understand the fiscal responsibilities of all of that. And it's not just your city or county, it's your state, it's our country. Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert Show, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. It's like midnight, I'm such a nerd, I'm looking it up. This is the US code that lists us as a federal corporation. It doesn't say that we're a capitalistic corporation, we are a social corporation. So shareholders in a federal system, do y'all follow me? This is our laws, this is who we are. So my city, Asheville, of 90,000 people is worth $12.8 billion. Billion. So as a corporation, my city would be six times the value of Ted Turner if it were in the stock market. Now does Ted Turner wake up every single day and see who's complaining on, on Facebook to shift his corporation around that? Of course not. So how do we, why do we do that in our city? Why do we think that that's the public realm of discourse and how we're going to look at our cities? Yet we all fall prey to that. And it's because we're talking as social creatures without understanding the cash flow. So my city in particular, now for Marion County, y'all can't like annex the next county over, so it's true for you all as well. The land that you have is finite. So my city is a finite boundary of land that has to function financially. So let's, let's talk about financial economics with land for a second. If you ever talk to a farmer or somebody who works on farms, they're all talking about land as an economic model. So it's the crop yield per acre, the water per acre, the labor per acre, et cetera. So this is one of our buildings that we rehab. So we put in retail, office, and residential. The city came in and did this first. So thank you, city. Thanks for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and the street tree. Thanks. That's awesome. That's a subsidy at our front door. This is what Chris got upset about, right? We didn't do that. That's you guys. OK, fair. Fair enough. But we took the taxable value from 300000 to $11 million. So the community, you all, get 3,500% more taxes off something that was sitting here. Do y'all follow me? Your taxes, your gains, just went up 3,500%. Y'all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? This is your money now, right? We're paying you 3,500% more taxes. Go out and buy 3,500% more garbage cans. I don't care. You know, this is how to grow your community's wealth. Y'all follow me? And some people are like, well, Joe, that's fine. That's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. Fair enough, that's double the value of our building, but it's not a fair way to look at it because per acre, or th this is consuming 34 acres of our corporation, this is on point two. So per acre, this is the tax yield difference between our building and Walmart. 
That's the tax efficiency of our building versus Walmart. People are like, well, what about the retail taxes? Fair enough, we got that too. We've got double the retail tax production. We've got a whole heck of a lot more residential than them. Could y'all imagine if I showed up presenting a 90 unit and acre residential building in your community? Like what train would you send me out of town on? Yet, that's not so bad. You know, and then jobs. We've got a lot more jobs in our building. So we've got more jobs, residents, retail taxes, and property taxes. The data's right there. Why aren't we looking at this stuff? You know, I was presenting this in Colorado last week. I was like, let me make it real simple for you people in Colorado. If you could grow something, what would you grow? Cash crop, right? It's a joke. You can laugh at it. That's fine. But we get it. Now, some of you might be thinking, OK, Joe, what's your problem? Why do you hate Walmart? If that's what you're picking up, you're totally wrong. It's not about Walmart. Don't hate the player, hate the game. So I, oops. Come on now. I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers, um, which is a pretty square conference. I don't know if y'all hang out with a bunch of assessors. Is there any tax assessors in the room? Good. Um, it's probably the squarest conference I've been to. It makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man. But, but these, these people are really, really on top of it. But they just, they're trapped in this bubble of doing math. Um, this guy presented at 8 o'clock in the morning. This is ahead of Walmart's property tax division. And Charles Terrell did this amazing PowerPoint show showing how cheap his buildings are. He did spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap his buildings are. I'm in the back of the room watching this all go down. I'm like, this is awesome. Think about this. One meeting, you're dropping 3,000 properties tax bills with one meeting. That's efficient, right? Assessors are agnostic. If it's low value, it's low value. They can't make new value on it. It is what it is. It's a cheap building. So I went up to the microphone and I asked them, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he immediately shot back 15 years, maybe 20. We designed that building to depreciate as quick as possible. We'll get out of that building, build another one, and depreciate it down again. We're more about the transportation system. We don't care about the buildings. So you've probably noticed this in communities where they've had a Walmart for over 20 years. It goes dark, and one pops up further down the road. That's their business model. Don't hate the player, hate the game. And it's your corporation. Do you want this in your corporation? Is that a tax investment model that you want in your corporation? As long as you're consciously making that choice, great. Their commitment to you is the, is the, is the life cycle of a cat. That's what you get. Sorry to the cat people. I'm a dog person. It's a joke. I'm making the point about their minimal, minimal investment to you. So I breezed through a lot of information, and you want to realize that this isn't compl complex math that I'm doing here. It's, it's essentially fifth grade division. We don't talk about cars and talk about the miles per tank, do we? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s. And you just say, you know, imagine if I was out in the hallway and I'm like, my truck gets 650 miles per tank. You'd be like, Joe, that's stupid. All tanks are different sizes. We say miles per gallon and the numbers change and we should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. Do you follow me? This is a $3 commodity and we already understand efficiency with that. Why don't we do it for a $30,000 commodity? And the land is limited. So we need to look at land that way. So we've done this all across the country. Um, and just wrapping up everybody's data, for every dollar of taxes somebody out at the periphery of the county is paying to the county, their brother and sister in the city is paying about five times that. Here's the Walmart, here's the mall, and this is a two-story building on a main street somewhere. This could be in Driggs, Idaho, Durham, North Carolina, or Dallas. As soon as you start stacking stories, that's a three-story building and a six-story building. This is the tax productivity to your community. So um, if I can show you what's going on in your brain and your creative thought process is the green stuff and your brainstem activity is the blue stuff, can't I use technology to map your economics or do an economic MRI of what's going on in your community? So this is um, Hennepin County, which is home to Minneapolis. Can you all guess where downtown Minneapolis is? Boom, right? So let's go back to Asheville for a second. So this is my county. 350 square miles. This is non-taxable. This is a big park right here. That's Mount Mitchell. So it's not paying taxes. It's non-taxable. I don't care about it. Green is low value. Purple is high value. So this is over uh, $10 million of value per acre. This is under 100000 So you have low value up here. In purple, this is high value. That's the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house right there. So when Bill Cecil, the heir to the Vanderbilt Mansion, shows up at one of our council meetings, we all genuflect and thank him for his time. His house is worth $100 million. That's pretty cool, right? But it's not fair because he's sitting on 2,000 acres of land 
and his house is 180,000 square feet. Do y'all have a 180,000 square foot house? No. He's got the biggest gas tank. So rather than total value, here's value per acre. And then here it is in 3D. Um, and you can see what's going on. So you can see downtown here, we don't even have to label it. And you can see it popping up. And here's our little sister of Black Mountain, which is about nine miles away. We can see its main street popping up as well. So that traditional pattern of town making shows up in the model. This is just a little two-story buildings and, and a little downtown kind of thing right there. And we can see what's going on. So from a tax system standpoint, all different states operate different levels. So this is all how you function financially at a local level. Red is property taxes, green is retail taxes. So you all get very little retail taxes back in your community. But there are states where we work in where we can get better retail data. But for you all, it really doesn't matter. But let's just go ahead and show you an example in Colorado. In Colorado, the counties get all the property taxes, the cities get all the retail taxes. So they're really motivated to m m match retail. So Durango is a really nice example. It's in southwest Colorado. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, here's their property tax model. And you can see downtown. And then this is the strip. So this is the Walmart, the mall, the Home Depot. It's all down over here. This is the retail model. Who would have thought that a little downtown was that much more retail productive than a monolithically retail environment? Total productivity and then jobs. So we had a couple business owners that were like, Joe, look, we want to do an apples to apples comparison of this. Um, Peter has a bookstore. He likes talking about honey. Uh, Tim has a coffee shop and he sells kitchen stuff for some reason. But they gave us their books and so we compared them. So this is the land comparison between these two businesses and the Walmart. Here's the property taxes produced by those two small businesses versus the Walmart. Here's the retail taxes. Who would have thought that those two businesses were 15 times the property taxes and five times the retail taxes? But that's the data. And then jobs. They've got more jobs too. OK. <clears throat> this is a quick economic analysis. Now let's take the next level of economic conversation. Who's paying their retail employees more per hour? The local businesses? or the, the national business? Probably these guys, right? It may be a nickel more an hour or a quarter. It's probably going to still be more. Now let's ask the next level of economic questions. Who's hiring the local website designer, the local attorney, the local accountant, the local ad executive? This side or that side? This side. Now let's talk about the social side. Who's showing up at a meeting like this at night? Who's volunteering to be on the planning board? Who's helping with a little league team or, or a basketball team? This side or that side? This side. If we're not looking at this and asking ourselves the value choices of where we're going to put our investment and not doing the math on that, you're essentially squandering your community's values. Just run the numbers on it and make choices. You know, people in Colorado told me, they're like, well, we get, we get cheaper goods here. And I'm like, well, if it's worth it for you to get 10 cents a roll cheaper toilet paper by changing your community economics, go for it. But just make sure you're writing that down. This is a transactional cost. Is it worth it to you? The average Walmart consumes more in police services than it pays in property taxes. Did you all know that? So you're essentially paying to police the Walmart. Just write that down. This is something we want to see as our community value. This is worth the investment. If it is, knock yourself out. I'm not going to make that choice for you. So. Um, you know, Bill Clinton said that this is uh, the economy stupid, but I, I would take it to the next step out and say this is ec economic stupid. We need to understand the economics of how places operate. And I'll show you some of the things that happen. So this is West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, you can see where the ocean is right here. And you can see where all the value is hugging the coast. But we find things like this. People always tell me, they're like, Joe, you just want to see big buildings everywhere. And I'm like, no, you're missing the point. This is a three-story building on Main Street that's 10.5 million an acre. This is a skyscraper two blocks away at 9.2 million an acre. So that is more productive than that. Y'all follow me? That's the math. So who would have thought a three-story building is more productive? And like, do the math on your community and understand where your values are. So um, just for fun, again, this is before he became president, but we grabbed the Donald's property. So he's pulling $400,000 $400, of value per acre for all of his assets. This is in one of the poor African-American neighborhoods. These shotgun shacks are actually more productive than him. I showed this to the community, and one of the city commissioners said to me, he goes, well, that's not right. And I said, correct. <laughs> it's not right. But if we're not looking into this data, 
in saying, is this the right thing for our community's values? Is this what we really want? Don't hate the player, hate the game. If we're not taking part of the game to see what's going on, we're missing this all around us. There's questions about equity and values all throughout our tax system. Small places, even a little town called Brevard, North Carolina. This is a tiny little place, 8,000 people. It's, it's, it's like Mayberry. It's like up in the mountains from Asheville. Um, the mayor's name is Mayor Jimmy. Mayor Jimmy has been mayor for 20 years. He's super awesome. His, uh, his hardware store is right next to City Hall, so he just basically rolls across the property line when he wants to have a meeting. And Mayor Jimmy asked us to do their analysis, so here's, here's their community. And as soon as he saw it, he's like, well, hell, I can tell where downtown is. And he's like, well, you know, if, if this is our downtown, then, then I want to know we're doing the stormwater system. I want to be able to model that. So we modeled it. Um, so here's their tax system as a monochrome, and we made like a jello mold of their stormwater system. So here's their stormwater system, and you can see downtown's impervious. I get it. So is the string all the way down through the city of all the grocery stores and Kmart and Walmart and all of that stuff. So when you drop that on the tax system, this is what it looks like. And you can see that the downtown is actually paying its share versus this stuff. So they're mountain people. So we made a mountain profile to show them this is your tax model. Um, this is your stormwater system. This is the difference. So you've got the downtown and you've got the strip out here. So you can see the downtown is actually tax productive. Now the parking lots outside of downtown are not. So you might want to do something different here. Maybe charge it a little bit more because you're not getting a lot of taxes out of that stuff. But out here, you're not getting hardly anything and you're picking up all that cost in stormwater. That's not a fair comparison. You can actually map the stuff out and see it. Is this all too nerdy? Are you guys all right with all of this stuff? Good? Okay. Um, so not all impervious surfaces are created equal. When you drive by a parking lot, that parking lot's paying you very little taxes. The building's paying you more. So there's a disincentive when you start to tax on or charge impervious surface at the same rate. So we believe this is all about financial literacy. We need to understand the finances of our city to understand what we're building and make sure that it's producing wealth for us. Uh, South Bend, Indiana. Um, I know that y'all consider that maybe not part of Indiana. It's more like Chicago, but it's up there. Um, you've got the same uh, situation in taxes. But here's the village being built around Nor Notre Dame is this big area right there. This is the village by Notre Dame. These are like four-story buildings. Here's the downtown. Um, the way that your tax system works in your state, your state gives you all tax breaks that the voters vote on. So you all voted on this stuff. Um, so if you're a disabled person, uh, veteran that has a historic uh, heritage barn with solar panels on it, you're doing good. You're getting a lot of tax breaks, right? So we made a model of their city. Uh, not a lot of tax breaks are light. A lot of tax breaks are in blue. So there's, there's people that are taking more advantage over the tax breaks in the community. But this stuff is paying full freight. Your commercial properties get no deductions. So right out the door, we're just like, whatever, it's commercial, let's tax them more. Well, just be aware that when that business gets that tax bill, what do they do? They fold that right into the rent. So y'all are paying for it one way or another. You know, I don't just have money coming out of my pockets. I have to make that money somehow. And that's how the buildings work. I charge rent. It's that simple. So looking at the, removing the commercial properties and looking at deductions, and we can zoom into the neighborhoods. They wanted to ask about equity issues. So we zoomed in. These two neighborhoods side by side, and you can see one's more blue than the other one. So one's paying 55% of their tax bill. This neighborhood is paying 85% of their tax bill. So these folks are paying more of their taxes than those neighborhood. They're right side by side. Architecturally, they're the same thing. They're both post-war uh, suburban houses, boxes. But when you look at the racial makeup, the neighborhood that's paying more of their freight is more African-American. The neighborhood that's paying less of their taxes is white. Do you understand that? Are you looking at this? Is this fair? Make sure that you're being informed about this stuff. Now, they were willing to look into this, and it came down to two things. The African-American neighborhood had more renters in it, which meant more, paying more of their taxes, because their family ownership of holding onto their properties, holding onto grandma's house, yet the kids all moved to Chicago, they're going to rent that house out. The other thing is the question of whether or not they have access to the information. Are you marketing these tax deductions to people properly? And South Bend had the wherewithal to say, OK, we need to do a better job at communicating this stuff. But they were willing to look in this. So um, the other thing is, notice what this does at a localized level. This is just zooming into one street. 
Look at the taxes on just one street, like up here, down there, up here, down there, up here, down there, up here, down there. That's not a consistent pattern. The cost that you all have to pick up is consistent. So bear in mind, who wants to pay their taxes? Show of hands, let's, I want to pay a lot of taxes. Like no one wants to pay taxes. But we're all in a system that costs money. And we have to be mindful of that. And there are certain things like roads that don't undo themselves once they're down. That becomes a long-term liability. So speaking of liabilities, we measured their pipes. This is their, um, their population growth since the 1800s. So their apex year, their best year ever was 1963. And that's when South Bend lost Studebaker and Packer to Detroit. Their population declined and they kind of flatlined. So just for fun, we, made a, uh, we put their pipes in the ground. This is them growing their pipes since the 1800s. And I'll drop a boundary when their population stops. Um, right about here. You all see a problem? They're adding pipe and not adding more people. So what you're doing is you're adding expense and not adding people to pay for it. This is a recipe for disaster. So they, they ran this pipe all the way down here to try to draw a Walmart in and the Walmart didn't come. So what did they do? They're just like, well, we've got a pipe in the ground, let's use it. That's called sunk cost, right, Joe? It's like, no. No, these people will never pay for the cost of that pipe, nor these people. Residential households, we don't pay our share of taxes. It just doesn't cover the nut. And then on top of that, if you're not adding more people, you're robbing people from the center of town and moving them further out, which then takes down the value of that stuff down here. You're essentially shooting yourself in the foot. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Does that make any sense? So pay attention to this stuff. Now, this is their pipe growth indexed against their population growth. And I asked them, I'm like, were your grandparents camels? They could live with so much less water than you guys? You guys are pigs. Now, this is their pipes will go from end to end, from South Bend to my office. I'm like, that's a lot of pipe. Can you see yourself going broke by what you're doing? Just pay attention to this stuff. So Charleston, um, this is one of my favorite cities. This is, uh, this is the three county area. And I told them, I'm like, look, you know, you didn't make the ocean, God did. So we're gonna go ahead and wipe away that value because you can't claim it. This is what humans made. Um, but Charleston's a super old place. It was born before we were as a country. So we have our birth date, July 4th, 1776. So here's a building built in 1686. That's the oldest liquor store in the entire United States right there. There's a revolutionary getting his drink on. Um, but just grabbing those buildings, here they are in the model. Here they are in plan. So 21 acres of those buildings, this is what they paid in county taxes in 2015. They paid a city tax and a downtown tax on top of that. This is just what the county got. Out in the county, we've got a Walmart that's 21 acres. This is what it paid the same year. Now remember, this was born in 2005. It's going to be gone by 2030. These buildings have been around for 240 years. They've survived hurricanes, fires, an earthquake, half a dozen wars. Are we building long-term wealth for our community? Are we leaving wealth for our kids and our grandkids? Are we thinking this model through? It's our community. So do the math on this stuff. Um, for y'all, we're just starting this process. We're gonna be going through thinking this way as this planning process continues. But we started up your map. This is your county total value. So think of this as miles per tank. And you can see like around the beltway out here, you see all of the purples and reds. Well, again, these are huge tracts of land, so they're gonna be really valuable. So rather than total value, here's the value per acre. And now you start to see a hot spot in downtown in this kind of like blast zone out here. Um, the transit line, here's downtown. Um, you know, you've got two main transit lines, blue and, or sorry, blue and red uh, through town, or sorry, there's blue. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on that corridor and what happens in here. And as we look at this, our job on the team is think of us like a radiologist. We're gonna do these kind of CAT scans and see what's going on from a valuation standpoint. And, and you can find some great things. The other thing is also thinking about the land of opportunity. So that zone right there is about 9,700 um, acres. So close to 10,000 acres of land. Right away we found that you've got 5% of that is vacant land. So that's land that doesn't have a building on top of that. That means that it's not paying that much taxes. That should be your lowest hanging fruit. Go after that, get that built, do whatever you can because you're paying for the infrastructure in front of it. You wanna get taxes on that. Um, another one we like to do is where the dirt is actually worth more than the building on top of it. 
that tells you that it's economically upside down. It's a really weird thing to look at, but it's surprising how much real estate it is. That's 11%. And that may be like a dead jiffy lube that's like been sitting there vacant forever. It's not, that building is not going to give you a lot of taxes. Um, then you have this stuff. This is your buildings that are taller than one story. They have a lot of mass to them, so they're paying taxes. Or they're your civic buildings, your schools like this thing, um, parks, stuff that you have of a higher value at a community level. That's off the table. You're not going to tear this school down and do something with it. This is a good asset for your community. You can do lectures in it. Um, but this stuff, you've got a lot of one-story buildings that are sitting in there that may be a tired Dunkin' Donuts or Jiffy Lubes or something. You know, it's an opportunity for you. But somewhere in here is a sweet spot. We're going to try to figure that out, that this is your opportunity of redevelopment down here. And this is where you can focus on cultivating new crop. Now, just if you just arbitrarily just pick that line right there, that's still about 4,000 acres of real estate. That's a lot of opportunity for you to cultivate wealth. Um, looking at some examples, just kind of doing a little, this is kind of how we look at the world. You know, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like when you go to your doctor and they put an x-ray up and they start pointing at your bones and like, here's where the hairline crack is. This is what we do. So just finding some properties like these two little guys over here, that one right there. And, you know, here they are in your community. This building right there, that's 1.6 million an acre. This, these little dudes right here are 500,000 an acre. A Walmart's 400,000. So this building right here, these two buildings are more productive than a Walmart. These, are, these houses are way more productive than a Walmart. Um, or this little guy right there. Who would have thought that that's 1.5 million an acre? Uh, that's about uh, seven times your mall in tax production. Would you have thought that? And again, this is all part of your family. They're all just sitting there. And then the, the newer stuff that's been coming in, these guys, like that thing. Um, there's some right here or that. So this is the one out by... Um, Broad Ripple, that thing, is pulling 11 million. These townhouses on Alabama that are from the 1920s are pulling four to eight million dollars of value per acre. These are probably illegal to rebuild these things because of your zoning code. So why not? Why not reproduce those? This building's 10 million an acre, and this building's 34 million an acre. Remember, the Walmart's 800,000 an acre. So as you build this infill, you're building housing opportunity for folks, but you're also cultivating a high density of taxation in your community that pays for that bus system. So if you're not measuring this stuff, you can't manage it. There's subsidies baked into the system all around you that you just have to be conscious of. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so this is one of my favorites. If you take a look at, the, your, your, take a look at your tax bill, Go home and take a look at it. You'll see a dirt value, and you'll see an improvement value or a building value on top of it, right? We can go into the computer and just turn off the buildings and just look at the dirt value. Um, this is Cheyenne, Wyoming. This is one of my favorite maps. And you expect the world to look like this. Everybody's dirt value in that neighborhood up there in the upper left is the same value, right? It's all blue, $15,000. But check out what's going on here. This is blue. Right here is orange. So it goes from 15000 to... 40,000 just by crossing the street. Do y'all follow me? For dirt. So this is the same zoning category. It's the same fire district, same school district, same police district, same everything. How is it land doubles in value when you cross the street? I was presenting this at 8 o'clock in the morning in Cheyenne, and the tax assessor was sitting in the front row, and she just raises her hand, and she's like, she just yells out, you don't understand. And I'm like, what am I missing? She goes, well, they have more land. The more land you have, the lower the value. That was the mayor's response. He actually started laughing so hard, he almost spat coffee out of his nose. It was really funny. I'm like, really? I've got three quarters of a mile of road here, three quarters of a mile of road here, another half mile and half mile. I've got three miles of frontage. This fellow's got 200 feet. You know what her response was? We don't count the infrastructure as part of the valuation. I said, so the money that you put in the ground, you don't want it back. She goes, no, that's not part of our standard. Our standard is the more land you have, the lower the value. Now, you all can clearly see that somebody built a mall on top of that. So when you have a larger property of land, you can afford to do a bigger building. When you do a bigger building, what happens? You get more trips. More trips means more car accidents, which means more fire calls. You get more commerce, which means more police calls because of more theft. So do you charge me for my fire calls and for my police calls? She goes, no, that's not part of our standard. This is our tax system, folks. 
So, I, you know, it's funny, is there, the reason why I was at that conference is their magazine is called um, Fair and Equitable. And um, so I asked them, I'm like, how is this fair and how is it equitable? You know what their response was? It's not. I'm like, seriously? Where did this come from? They're like, we don't know. You should talk to Larry. So I meet this guy, Larry Clark, in the hallway, and I'm like, Larry, did, did Moses deliver this to you? Like, where did this come from? <laughs> to, to his credit, he's like, well, it's not fair, it's not equitable, we probably need to change it. You know, it's probably something from the 1700s in our tax code that came across the Atlantic when we came from England, and no one's really kind of looked at it, but now that you pointed out, we probably need to change it. It'll just take a little while to get through the system. You think that there's some adults that can have thought this through, and it's just like, these are the habits of our government operating with these wild inefficiencies all over the place, and no one's looked at this stuff. We need to understand this better. Is this mind-blowing to you all? I mean, you all get this? This is crazy. So these aren't invisible market forces that are making me choose this stuff. They're tax system incentives that give me the best benefit to do this stuff, which is fine. Just make sure you're conscious of it. So I'll show you one more other one example. Peoria, Illinois, they told us they had a parking problem downtown. So I'm a map guy. I'm like, all right, we'll measure it. Here's your water. Here's your grass and park stuff. Here's your streets and sidewalks. Here's all your surface parking. Here's your buildings. Of those buildings, these are all parking garages. So I said to them, I'm like, look, doesn't look like you got a parking problem. Looks like you had a perception problem or you're too lazy or something. I don't know. But this is, that's what you got. So what's crazy is for the average Peorian, there she is. These are their numbers. For the average Peorian, she has 1,200 square feet of building committed to her in the entire county, and she's got 2.5 parking spaces dedicated to her across the entire county. Do you all know your numbers? So you need to look at this stuff to see what's going on, because when the assessor goes out there, if I build this stuff, the assessor is going to follow behind me with a pricing gun, right? The value of a building is about 35 bucks a square foot. The value of parking is about a buck 40. The cost of the road that you have to pick up is going to be nine dollars. Oops, come on now, nine dollars a square foot in front of that, and nine dollars a square foot in front of this. Do y'all follow me? Yet when you tax things differently, there's a subsidy, right? So if we're all paying two percent in property taxes, you're paying two percent on top of thirty-five bucks, or two percent on top of a buck forty. That means you're getting twenty-seven times less taxes out of that parking than the building. Do y'all follow me? Because this cost is the same here in front of that and here in front of that, yet this is paying 27 times less taxes. That's a subsidy. When we say we want parking, just bear in mind what you're doing is you're taking money out of your own pocket to make that happen because I'm going to be taxed less as the property owner to give you all that parking. That's what's going on. So when we do their models, this is no surprise to us when they drop off around the downtown because most downtowns are hammered with a bunch of parking all around them like a choker collar. When you go out into the burbs, the reason why it's so easy to get a parking space is because we've mandated a ton of parking out there. It's all sitting there hiding in plain sight. So we took the whole entire county and did the same thing. If you take all the buildings and shove them together, this is the footprint of all the buildings of an entire county's worth of buildings. That's it. That's all the land that you needed to use for an entire county. But I understand you're not Europeans. You don't want to be so close to each other. You know, you're not crazy people from the Netherlands or something. You want to stretch out. This is America. Well, when you stretch out, you have to park it. So this is the land dedicated to parking, and here's the roads. That's the liability that y'all get to pick up. So here's the buildings. You, have, you actually have nine square miles, or Peoria, nine square miles of parking and only 8.6 square miles of buildings. This is your liability. This is everything else. This is your berms, buffers, backyards, farms, parks, whatever. When you look at the money, this is the money. Let me do it on a per square mile basis, so it's apples to apples. So you're getting a billion dollars of value per square mile out of this. Your parking's only giving you 40 million. Your roads are costing you 250 million a square mile. And then this is everything else. The stuff that we love, we don't tax it, right? So let me ask you a question. Why does the car stationary not cover the cost of the car moving? Shouldn't these two match? But we don't see that transaction, right? We just have to keep on plowing the roads. We still have to do stuff. We don't see that there's a transactional cost that happens. We lose money out of this stuff. 
we could have that money for other uses if we had an active choice in that. Is that the best use of your money? That's your call. But bear in mind, they have enough roads to go from Peoria to Vancouver, British Columbia. Do you all know how much roads you got? So we were at a meeting today and somebody belted out, it's actually about five times that. You can't drive on them because you can't afford them. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Exactly. But these are all choices that we made going into this. We built too much stuff. And you're not, you're not alone in this. So every American city's kind of been through this. But this is really spatial analysis. If you're not putting on a map, by the way, this joke only works for people over the age of 35. I get it. I've learned this one. It's spatial. So on the costing side, this is how we're going broke. We did a project in Lafayette, Louisiana. We did it with uh, Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. I'd highly recommend his blog to you all. He does a great job of analyzing cities and how they operate. Um, he's from Minnesota. But here's their tax model. Here's downtown. Here's some new urbanism, which is like a little baby downtown compared to that. And they spread out into the swamps. So pavement. When, when I, as a developer, build a subdivision and give you the roads, it's not a gift. It's a liability on your children. So here's all their roads. They have six and a half square miles of roads. What was funny is, as I was presenting this to the city council, one of their councilors said this to me. I love this. It's not where you live. It's what you believe. What does that even mean? <laughs> I believe I look like Brad Pitt. Sooner or later, I've got to walk by a mirror, right? You know, it's like we can believe whatever we want, but then there's reality. Now, the public works director, to his credit, I mean, these are Cajun people. They're really funny. This was his response. I know. There's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry. Um, and Kevin's funny. He's like, look, I got $200,000 to chip and seal whatever roads you want this year. That means it's going to be a quarter mile. You get to pick it, whichever you want. That's all I got. <laughs> and he's a, so we had to Photoshop Kevin in on that one. Um, so Kevin's like, just explain it to them. What's the problem? I'm like, here's the problem. So your, your finance officers, every city follows this thing called a CAFR standard. It's how they organize the tax system. So if you all run for office and become an elected official, the first thing that you're going to be handed is a budget document that's going to follow these standards. In those standards, your roads are listed as assets. So are your pipes and everything else. One of the things that we asked the finance officer is I said to her, I said, look, Lori, if I've got that computer over there, that's an asset. If I had delivery vehicles, those are assets. If I owned a hot dog stand, those are assets. I can sell you that computer, this van, or that building. Can you pick your roads up and can you sell them to Baton Rouge? Can you guys sell your roads to South Bend? No. And she goes, well, but our CAFR standards. I said, Lori, look, I'm not going to follow your CAFR standards. No one's going to show up from Chicago and give me a demerit. We're going to actually cash flow you so you see what happens. And Chuck goes, that's a liability. And she's like, our CAFR standards. I'm like, we're not following them. So this is, this is their debt load of their roads. So when I build a building and put an air conditioner on the top, for a larger building, the air conditioner is going to cost me $100,000. I know that it's going to fail in 20 years because it says so in the manual. So what I have to do is charge you all rent in my building and squirrel away money for 20 years to have $100,000 again because I'm going to get hit with a huge bill. I've got to build that money, right? So the building's got a cash flow. So this is the cash flow liability of all the roads that they've got. This is the actual money that they have to pay for that. Let me ask you a complex municipal finance question. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? No. This is the reason why Kevin's like, I only got so much money. Now, here's what's scarier. This load is 18 times the revenue. Now, what do most communities do when they're broke? What do you do for roads? You go out and get a bond, right? Bonds ain't free, folks. The bonding company has first right of refusal on your money. So what they're going to do, they're going to give you that loan. It's like paying off your mortgage with a credit card. Like, why would you do that? It doesn't make the bill disappear. You have to put, pay the credit card. So the bonding company is skimming off the top half the money that's coming in the door because they've got first right of refusal on it. So you really only have $25 million, not $55, to pay for a billion. This is why you can't keep up with your roads. You're broke. Say what you want. Either lower your standards on what you want for your quality of roads or start getting rid of some of them. We actually had a policy for them to let some of them revert to dirt. Just let them go. You just don't have enough money. Communities are going to have to make hard choices going forward. So here's the deal. This is their whole city floating in the lake. County, I mean. 
and green are the taxes coming out of the properties and red is the cost of those properties and where they live. So we netted out the cost against the, the, the revenues. So what's in the black versus what's in the red. So you can see which ones are being subsidized. This is the whole county in 3D. You can see them bleeding their money all over the place. And if you take this thing and slap it on the floor, this is what it looks like. I don't know if any of y'all are colorblind. This is a colorblind model. But this is basically, it was really funny. They're like, well, Joe, but people really want to live out here. And I said, yeah, hell yeah, that's what you're subsidizing them to move out there. You'd be stupid to not move into those neighborhoods, right? That's called a subsidy. And make sure you have enough green stuff to pay for that red stuff, which you don't. You're going broke. So we have to see our communities with an agnostic understanding of the math and just suspend your biases and beliefs for a second. Let's see what's happening and then make a community call on this. Is this what you really want? So the scary thing is, in 1950, they had 34,000 people, five feet of pipe per person, 2.4 fire hydrants per thousand people. This is the infrastructure they had per people, right? Um, they grew their population to 121,000. This is their feet of pipe per person now. Their fire hydrants per thousand now. So a 350% growth in population, 1,000 and 2,000% growth in liability. And they, you know what their response was? We're rich. We got oil money out of the Gulf. We've got lots of money now. I'm like, all right, I'll measure that too. So here's your household income adjusted for today's dollars. Yeah, you were poor um, and you got richer. They're actually richer than we are here in Asheville. So that's cool. But that's only 160% growth in revenue and 1,000 and 2,000% growth in liability. This is like me getting a $2,000 a year raise and convincing my wife into building an 80,000 square foot addition on my house. It doesn't make any economic sense. Yet we've been doing this because most of these bills don't come due for 40 or 50 years. So I'll show you that example in Lancaster, California. Here's Los Angeles. Lancaster's up and over the mountain. It's at the edge of the county. It might as well be in another state. It just, it's not part of Los Angeles. But there are 166,000 people. Their city manager knows they're going broke. Um, 166,000 people, they've got one building on Main Street that's, th that's three stories tall. Can you all spot it in the model? That's not good for the scale of what their community is. They need a much bigger Purple Mountain to compensate for their losses. So um, the scary thing is, though, they have uh, 953 miles of roads. You might wonder what that looks like. They basically have enough road to go from Los Angeles to Portland. That's not good. So here's their roads in a timeline. We put them from 1910 to 2015. So their great grandparents went on a little road building spree right here. They got a little crazy and then they went to sleep for a while. Then after World War II, look what happened over here in the 1950s. You can't help but notice what their grandparents did with that one right there, right? So that one pops in. That's a lot. Well, guess what? When your grandparents built that, that comes back to haunt your parents' generation 50 years later when you have to rebuild that entire road right there. Now when your community is hit with that huge capital expense, what do you hear your city councilors do? We need more money, we need more permits, we need to get, make money somehow. You're going through this right now, right? Y'all are essentially functionally broke. So where do we get the money for our raises for staff so they can at least be, we treat our staff nice? How do we fix our roads, how, our roads that are in bad shape? How do we fix those? And what most communities do is they allow more permits. More permits, if you add more roads, here they are, Come on now. Boom. That's the roads that get added. So if another 40 years later, you've got to fix those roads again for their second life cycle, and they bring along with it the new stuff. So we went ahead and just did a build-rebuild cycle of their roads, and we stopped them in 2015. We're like, you're not going to add another road from here to forever. Do you all see the pro problem? That first time that we did that, after World War II, no one tested this stuff out. No country was before us, like, laying infrastructure all over the place with lots of money and just letting it go. But we told ourselves, this is what makes America, America. We can all drive around, we all have cars, whatever. And we just went ahead and repeated that cycle again because we convinced ourselves this is who we are. Well, guess what? Now it's capitalizing on itself and getting bigger and bigger without adding any more infrastructure. Again, they're not adding anything else and look at how it's capitalizing. These costs get bigger and bigger the more they start laying on top of themselves. And we're all going through this. We need to step out of what's happening, the way that we think cities operate, look at the data, and make better decisions. So they can only afford 50% of their roads with the money that they have. So they either have to raise taxes, change the fee structure on how they pay for roads, let some go, maybe send some back, 
cul-de-sacs. Why should the whole entire community pick up the cost of a cul-de-sac? That's a private driveway for five people or four people. So that's one of, the th one of the things they're considering. But I just want you to know that every community is going through this. You aren't alone in this. You're either growing in a pattern where you can't see it because too much new money's coming in and you can't see the, the failure, or you're at a point where you've got to wake up like Detroit or Lancaster. So one last example is Eugene, Oregon. And I don't know if you know much about Oregon. Oregon has growth policies. They're very proud of them. But um, even in Eugene, Oregon, they can only afford three quarters of their roads. So their roads will go from Eugene to San Francisco, but they run out of money in Mendocino. Um, but we did their, their tax model the way that we did uh, Lafayette. Come on now. So this is a net model of what's net positive and net negative. So here's the top of the city, the net positive stuff. If you lift it up and look at the bottom, like under a rock, this is what it looks like. So what they've done is they've given themselves all of these tiny little checks. The American single family house is subsidized. That's it. So when we buy into that pattern, we all want to buy into that subsidy. I get it. So these are all the subsidies across the model, which is cool. Just make sure you can afford it and write it down. So when you look at the building types, we call this the Brady Bunch slide. So we've got the residential, low, medium, high, mixed use, low, medium, high, commercial, low, medium, high. This is how it pencils out at, the, at a basic level. The single family house is subsidized. Again, remember back to the Nixon report. There's a lot of frontage and a lot of infrastructure for a very little amount of taxation. That's the way it works. I'm not judging it. Just make sure that you're writing that number down. And you certainly shouldn't have 80% of your city in that land use. That's too much of that one typology. So remember back to my story about my family. Um, I was talking with the people in Eugene, and I started losing it because the meeting was going late. And, and they asked me why. And I said, well, I ate a cheeseburger today. And I have a rule that when I eat a cheeseburger, I'm going to go out and exercise and ride my bike. And then I'm going to eat a salad. So this is my rule. And I need to keep my diet in balance, right? So are you doing the same thing with your land uses? Are we balancing out these costs that we have? And just make sure that you're writing this stuff down. The same way that we look at our nutritional facts on our food. So what you'll notice out here, let's see that guy, that little thing pops up right there. So I said, look, you, you got some stuff going on out here. Just grow more of that here, 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 and here. Just start adding some wealth in your community and pick some areas that can grow up a little bit and help add to your downtown. But don't like hammer your downtown and make your downtown cover the cost of everything. It can't carry everything. It is your golden goose, but you got to feed it every once in a while. But you can make some other, go other geese out here. Why not? Look for areas to cultivate your wealth. Now, one of the other things about conscious acts of choice, I'll just give you one simple example. This is their stormwater system. So when you have stormwater, and you all have a stormwater system, your stormwater system has to cover the cost of taking water off land that doesn't absorb rain. So when rain hits this building, it doesn't go into the ground, right? It goes into a pipe out into the street. Well, your street is also impervious surface. So we did their whole city. This is their city land area. This is their city land area as a square, right? So that's it. That's all of Eugene. Here's their buildings, parking, and roads. So they're about, let's call it half impervious surface. These are the square areas of this stuff and the money, right? So did you consciously choose to spend $600 million in roads? Just asking. And that's money that you have to keep on reinvesting in perpetuity. But the other thing is you might want to find some more revenue in that parking. Think about it. But what's crazy is their stormwater system costs $400,000 or $400 million. And we're talking with the engineer, and he's like, look, it's all paid for. It's an enterprise fund. We get enough money from the buildings to pay for the stormwater. I said, well, what about the roads? Is the city paying for the roads? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, so if we compacted the city, that means we, lo we lessen the roads, right? If we can squeeze ourselves in a little bit and maybe get taller buildings and smaller space, isn't that a choice? He's like, well, I suppose so. I said, so if we get, and you drive around your community and count how many one-story buildings you see all over the place that could have something else on the roof. And it's just we allow people to underbuild in our community, which stretches itself out, because it takes more horizontal space with one-story buildings. So let's say we compacted our buildings a little bit and compacted our roads and parking. If we compact to half and half, doesn't that cut this number in half? 
which would be, I don't know, $200 million? Do y'all follow me? So if I've just cut your stormwater system in half by doing a different land development choice, I've just found you $200 million. Did you all decide that this is the best use of your $200 million for stormwater systems? Or could this be for after school programs for everybody's kids? Maybe free lunches on top of it. $200 million is a lot of money. Is this the best use of it? And make sure that you're writing all of this stuff down, that this is a good choice for you. So when you don't have the money for the greenway, the art teacher, or the dancing traffic cop, you don't have that money. It's not because you don't have it. It's because you've blown it in an infrastructure in a pattern that's not paying you back. It's draining your wealth. It's your choice. Make sure it's conscious. So my city, it... $13 billion is worth more than your professional sports teams combined. Do y'all follow me? We're actually about uh, 11 Colts in value. And I can guarantee you that the owner of the, uh, the Colts knows, I was going to have Andrew Luck in here, but you guys took him away from me. But anyway, he knows Jacoby Brissett's uh, towel bill, right? I can tell you the cups in our nightclub cost five cents a pop. Can you tell me how much a mile of pipe costs? What a mile of road costs? That has to be on the top of your tongue as you talk about community design. We need to understand this stuff and understand the costs of all of it to stay in business. So again, just to close, be literate about your tax policy. We're a country that was formed on a tax revolt. We should understand this stuff. And we call this geo-accounting. We just put your numbers on a map so you can see it. As we go through this process, we're going to help, hopefully help you make uh, transparent decisions about your community's wealth. Um, and like your accountant, we don't care about your choices. It's your choices. Your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? Your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. So make sure you're making choices you can afford. We're going to put your numbers on a map, and uh, we're going to do your math. So thank you. I guess we have time for questions. I don't, you all want to, any questions? Couple questions. Sir? Uh, you, sh you showed some charts for Indianapolis. Can you tell us more about what you've been hired to do and who you're doing it for and maybe even what they're planning to do with it once they get it? Okay, so we're working with the planning team who started the, the Gould Evans and see them as the surgeons and we're sort of like the radiologists. We're gonna like look at the numbers and see what's going on and see which buildings have a high tax potency and how productive they are. As they start talking about infill, fitting things in from an urban design standpoint, as you do your planning, that's traditional planning, drawing pictures and all that stuff, we'll be able to figure out what kind of value that's gonna produce from a taxable standpoint to figure out whether or not that's gonna cover the cost of the transit system that you've essentially just bought. So when you, when you won that grant for that transit system, it's essentially a $200 million transit system. Well, that's a federal grant that paid for that or a majority of it. But this is on you now. You've got to cover that cost. You have to make sure you've got the ridership up on that to pay for that system now that you have it. And what, what we'll hopefully figure out is what that math is within that. So we'll be back as, uh, as we go through the process to show what the drawings are going to be showing. But I just wanted you to be aware of this is the way that we look at the world, which is with these tax models um, and looking at how things cash flow. Does that make sense? And as far as who is the client, the client is the city of Indianapolis, um, together with Indigo. Um, we received a federal transit administration grant to support um, this effort to update our zone code. Let's take two it's more your, It's your body, I'm just a radiologist, so. Two more questions. I'm making pictures. Let's go in the back. You talk about empty spaces and not creating tax dollars, but with gentrification, now they're coming into these old areas putting these very, very expensive houses and increasing tax base, which the city wants. But what about the people that are there? And now they can't afford to live in the house that they've been in for 40 and 50 years and have kept these neighborhoods and areas going. Because when people want to move out to the suburbs, but now they want to move back in the areas, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. All you're doing is calculating dollars. No, uh, I want you to calculate your values. So if there's, if there's a question of gentrification, what I would do is, in, in my perspective, gentrification, I want to see 
my gentrification and my property value, my house. I want to see it raise in value if I ever sell it, right? I want to enjoy the wealth of my community growing up. Now the value question there is displacement. Displacing people out of their communities is the wrong thing. So if you set that as your goal, it's like let's talk about displacement. How do we keep people in their houses that have been there in that community? Well, part of that is do the taxes need to raise? If you've been in that house and been a productive taxpayer, does your tax need to raise? I'd say no. If you're creating more wealth in the area, you should be able to afford those services because you're capturing more wealth. The problem isn't the, the, the citizen who's been there. The problem is that land speculator or that person that's holding on the property not doing anything or that dead strip mall. That thing that's just sucking down the taxes because the less that they use that property, the lower the taxes they pay. While that homeowner has been carrying the burden of their taxes and being a fiscally responsible citizen. And it shouldn't matter if they're paying $900 in taxes, they're paying their tax bill. They're there on the street, they're part of your community. It's that speculative value that's draining you. So I think gentrification is kind of a touchy word because it doesn't get to the real issue, which is community displacement, inequity, and fairness. And that's what we're gonna to start to dig into is that what, what's, the, what's the tripping point? How do you keep people in their community and in their neighborhood? And if you can raise other parts of your community up, you can harvest more revenue to compensate for tax deductions, tax breaks, and keeping people in their houses. It's, it's been, yeah, making a conscious choice uh, for the community. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you saw with that Trump thing, I mean, this is a, neighbor, this, this is a neighborhood that, actually, let's go back to that for a second. And I know it was kind of touchy to put that into a show because of politics, but I was also doing that, you know, it's deliberately, it's a little bit of a shock value. Um, but let's, okay, what's not fair about this, let's go ahead and put me under the microscope, is that he got a golf course is zero tax value. How did he get that? Well, he sent his attorneys to go beat up the county and threaten a lawsuit, and he negotiated an entire golf course for free, basically. Is that fair? No. Did he play the system? Certainly. But let's put that aside for a second. There's Mar-a-Lago at a million dollars of value per acre. So there's the Winter White House at a million dollars of value per acre. And even that, these are almost as tax productive as Mar-a-Lago, is 600,000. So would, should we force these individuals out of their houses by charging them more, I would argue that they're already paying enough. What we need to do is find out why this is so inefficient. You know, that's about leveling the playing field because that's not fair. But you have to do the math to see that those subsidies are out there. All right, we'll take And I know that this is on tape, so <laughs> I'm probably gonna get, if I, if I disappear, you know what happened. <laughs> Yeah. Market analysis are going through. Like, how? What? What measures can we quantify of our value and worth? Uh, well, I, th I think a lot of it is. I, I would start by what you can measure. What's out there, like like this. This is this is very measurable, and it's. I mean, I have to say, this is disturbing when you see it, right? But yet, this was hiding in plain sight, and no one put those numbers together. So this is the first thing that you do. It's much harder to, to measure social connections, social capital, but you can do it. You can measure uh, community connectivity, uh, community support, time in a church. You know, there's, there's value of all that social capital in the community. You know, a church is non-taxable, but a, a church is a community value statement that we want that in our neighborhood and our community. 
So, you know, if you wanted to be crude about it, you'd be like, hey, Joe, you just don't want any churches anywhere. I'm like, no, I didn't. that's not true. I just want you to value choice that, that this is something we hold sacred and real, and it's okay for us to not get any money out of that. But you're making that choice, you know, as opposed to a surface parking lot, that you're not. So I don't, I don't know how deep you can go. There's a great book that I recommend. It's actually got an awkward name. It's called Happy City. But it's actually a great book from talking about the social capital that happens inside of a community. It gives you all of those measures, measurables. And you could do all that math, too. We're coming in at a level of looking at your tax flow, what kind of tax quirks you're up against. Um, because if you want to convert something from a surface parking lot or a dead strip mall to something else, what are the things that are in the way to make that happen? And also, how do you make it easy for local entrepreneurs and local, local folks to just build a building themselves? Should you have to hire a planning firm in a, in a law office to go get a building permit? You know, is, this, is that too complicated? Can you make that access to building community wealth easier for smaller, people, smaller entrepreneurs and smaller businesses as well? So sometimes public policy can get in the way. If the process is too opaque or too difficult or too, trans, or too not transparent enough, how do you make it simple? And that's what the design team is going to focus on is also that policy aspect of can you just, in your own neighborhood, do an addition on your house, build a, a rental apartment in your backyard for your, you know, to get some side income to support your house as well. Is that an easy thing or a hard thing to do? But that's also going to get more people next to the transit line, which is going to help the bus system because that bus needs people on it. All right, final question? Yeah, Brad, it's probably for you, because when he talks about policy, is that part of what they've been hired to do, is to change policies so that these kinds of things can happen in this transit overlay district that you're looking to create? So, so they have not been hired to change uh, tax policy. Uh, that is, that's, that's a state house uh, thing. Yeah, we really can't change it, but we can just make you aware of what the issues are. But understanding. So the key thing that I hope you take away tonight, hopefully you've all learned something new about how to think about the city. Um, I'll be honest, I learned probably more about public finance today in my three presentations with Joe than I learned in planning school. It's just a very different way to think about our city. And so the thing I hope you take away is that we've got a finite amount of land in our community. And we can choose to develop in parking lots that don't provide money for us to pave our streets or to hire teachers for our schools, or we can choose to develop them in other ways that do those things. Um, and so, in, in that way, it's, you know, tax, tax policy reform is probably, a, you know, might help fix all this. Um, that's not something that's in our scope right now. And so we're taking a look at our existing development patterns in our city. Um, how do they help us provide the services like police and fire and schools and libraries and parks and all those things that we need to thrive? And are there ways that we can change those development patterns given this half billion dollar investment that you all helped approve to invest in our community around our transit lines? That's where we're starting. Now there are places around our county that are not at transit lines. Wanamaker, West Newton, downtown Castle. Who knew Castleton used to be a little town? There are places like that um, that are not on rapid transit lines that probably could also use some rethinking about how we use that land um, because we are not maximizing the amount of revenue that we could probably get out of those to provide those services that we all want. And so I hope that, that that's, that's a lesson you take away. It's not about tax policy reform. It's, it's putting a new way of how we think about building our city. Um, in that we have choices in how we can use our land, and those choices can either bankrupt us or they can help us thrive. Good answer? Oh, good. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Joe. Thank you.